So, welcome everybody to the first Olafos seminar of the academic year. I remind everybody that the theme of the of the Alpha seminar this year is uh, necessity and possibility in uh, science. We will have around once a month a seminar, and of course, during the ne just to, to to tell to the graduate yeah. students during the next. The next uh, semester, the seminar will fusion with the graduate doctoral seminar on the, the same team. That will get to an apotheosis in the, in a workshop in May, beginning of May, on the same subjects with a golf paper. And already two keynotes have been have, co have confirmed their presence: Alistair Wilson and Nina Emery. But today. We have one of our own since he published a, a book on the, on the laws of nature in last May. He did. He just confirmed to me that he did not stop to think about it. And today <laughs> will be new materials, part of, I suppose, on what you already thought about before. New materials on natural necessity. So the, this is Michel Gaines, as everybody that can see him recognize. And the, the talk will be is, is entitled Powers Without Essence Metaphysical Foundation for the Natural Necessity of Laws of Nature. The floor is yours, Michel. Well, thank you very much, Alexandre. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak again in these uh, 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 seminars. Uh, as you said, uh, I published a, a book recently, but I, since this is a research seminar, I decided to speak also uh, about things that I don't fully understand. I think I understand <laughs> some things at all, you know, but uh, not, uh, not everything. Uh, so the, the, the menu is this. I will briefly uh, set the stage for further discussion and uh, uh, briefly defend some of the main points, you know, that uh, ground my, well, you know, philosophy of nature. Well, without uh, pretension, that is very, uh, we have to be very careful when you use those big words, even in philosophy, or maybe above all in philosophy. Uh, so first, what is a scientific law? Okay, uh, according to me, a scientific law is a universal proposition describing a regularity. So, a proposition is not something that belongs to the ontological stock or furniture of, of nature. It's a proposition, which belongs to a well-established, confirmed, etc. theory, and for which we have more reasons to believe that it is approximately true, rather than believing it false or suspending judgment. So this is what is I, my version of uh, epistemological scientific realism, the scientific, uh, the scientific realist uh, in epistemology must be rather modest and simply uh, that's that's enough. That's that's the, the what best that we can expect. That is to have more reasons to believe in, for example, the existence of electrons rather than not. And uh, maybe we are not sure. There is no certainty. But at least you know, in the present day, and uh, given what we know already, it's uh, it's. Uh, it's a, a, um, a reason, more reasonable to believe in the existence of, for example, electrons. So laws are not real, they don't belong to the reality of the world, and also I adopt a correspondence view, not theory of truth, at least in science, in this context, perhaps in other domains, you know, correspondence view of truth doesn't work. And so true uh, or approximately true scientific laws have mind independent external truth makers and those truth makers are regularities. For example, let's take a very simple example. This is the perfect gas uh, law. And uh, so in normal circumstances, E, all gases at equilibrium satisfy, that is make true, the formula uh, PV is equal to KT. Um, so, of course, there is an environment E, the normal circumstances, uh, when a law was or has been confirmed. I'm not to discuss, I'm going to discuss very much the normal circumstances. There is a lot of literature about that. 
but I don't think it's uh, it's well it's relevant to what I'm going to say, but not that relevant after all. So a law is a proposition, it can be true or false. It's, it asserts it asserts something about about the world that there are some regularities that satisfy this equation, and uh, uh, this equation is is not a law. It, it's what I call a nomological formula. But you know, in, in scientific textbooks, you know, where people they write in textbooks, physics or whatever, biology, and uh, and so on, economics, uh, they put a formula. But you have to tell to what kind of things or systems or entities uh, these uh, formula uh, apply. And uh, in this case, these are perfect gases. And uh, uh, so we have to specify in the complete formulation of the law the the set of things the set of things which are called in the literature particulars which can be particles systems fields that satisfy uh, the uh, formula so a quantity so quantity of gas is a particular which instantiates properties such as fluidity, resistance, and the properties mentioned in the nomological formula, pressure, volume, temperature. Uh, to avoid circularity, of course, you have to uh, identify what a perfect or almost perfect gas is independently of the nomological formula. Uh, and I think this can be done you know, with uh, other properties. But the point uh, which is important is that I don't think that we can defend that there is a substantial natural kind. Now, I'm trying to be as much as an empiricist as I can. I consider myself a kind of moderate empiricist, and uh, I am not in favor of the uh, ontological reality of natural kinds on top of properties that are shared by a certain class of, uh, of uh, entities. And on the other hand, I don't uh, uh, believe that there is a, a relevant ontological distinction between essential and uh, accident accidental properties. Of course, you know, there can be dis linguistic distinctions and things like that, but from an ontological point of view, I think we can get by without making an ontological distinction between those, this kind of properties. This, this is what I call the ontological democracy of properties. However, I think that there are natural properties, uh, uh, and those natural properties are the properties that are mentioned in, in the laws. Uh, so the laws have been identified as, as propositions belonging to scientific theories that are, that are confirmed. And then, and those truth makers are regularities. And then um, we have, of course, uh, terms in those laws, like pressure, volume, temperature, and those are natural properties. Uh, they are supposed to refer to uh, uh, real properties in, in the world. So I make a distinction between natural and unnatural properties, like uh, whistling uh, <coughs> an opera air while uh, fixing your, uh, your uh, a computer or something like that, you know, so there are those weird properties, but there are the natural properties, those are the ones that are mentioned in, uh, in bylaws, well, nomological formulas in scientific uh, theories. So the term gas or natural, natural kind terms, natural kind terms are abbreviations which refer to sets of particulars which uh, have regularly uh, associated properties. So I profess an entire realism about kinds, but a realism about some properties, and the, uh, among which the natural properties. Now, to say, you know that there is an important distinction between categorical properties and uh, dispositional properties, among which powers. Um, I think that uh, properties that are uh, Categorical are the uh, observable properties. That is something that uh, is uh, uh, defended by people like Ellis and other people, that uh, uh, when a property is observable, then it is a categorical property. 
property. Of course, there might be categorical property that are not uh, observable for some reasons, but when it is observable or it observed, then we know that it is a categorical property. Typically, categorical properties are properties pressure, uh, volume, temperature, mentioned in the nominological formula for perfect gases. This, um, these properties are categorical <coughs> properties. That can, that can take uh, several values, but you know these are take it are categorical properties. But I enlarged the class of uh, uh, observable properties and therefore uh, categorical properties to uh, properties like uh, mass, charge, temperature, etc. And I do not limit categorical properties contrary to what is current in the literature to geometrical and structural properties. Usually in the literature, categorical properties are the geometrical, in the broad sense, and structural properties. Now, I'm sorry because I explained that already in this, in this seminar, because that's something that I, I've been defending for years. I take mass, for example, gravitational mass, to be a, uh, an observable properties, an observable property. Why? Because when you have grasped the concept of gravitational mass in the context of some theory, of course, huh, we can perceptually check that a mass is heavier than another if mass differences are not too small. Okay? So, for example, uh, this, this thing here, huh, this computer, is heavier than this pointer, right? Uh, if you want, you can come and verify that, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you can, if masses are uh, sufficiently um, different by a simple experience, ordinary experience, perceptual sensory experience, you can check that, uh, you can check that this object, computer, is heavier than this pointer. Uh, of course, you can argue that you, we cannot perceive mass directly, okay? I, I, I accept that. Uh, we cannot per perceive mass directly, uh, you, uh, you can perceive hardness, for example, directly. But what is important is the, 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 the verification of propositions. propositions huh? So if you can check the, the truth or falsity of a simple proposition, like this computer is heavier than this pointer, then you have good reasons to believe, better reasons to believe than not in the truth of the proposition I just uh, mentioned. And this, if you take, if you take this broad view of observability, a broad view of observability, then you can defend a rather uh, extended uh, philosophical thesis, namely epistemological uh, uh, scientific realism because, well, electrons, for example, they have a gravitational mass, so electrons they have a, an observable property. Of course, you cannot, you don't have epistemological, direct epistemological access, or per, that is, perceptual access to the mass of electron, but you can apply what is known in the literature as a Kitcher's uh, Galileo, Galilean strategy is that step by step you can extend inductively the reliability of instruments provided that the results coincide coincide with in overlapping domains okay so there is of course there are inductive steps uh, inductive steps but you know since the properties are observable at least uh, 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 in principle then you can check the reliability of instruments step by step. Of course, there are many steps you know, uh, that you have to perform when you start from these two objects till the mass of the electron, all right? But that's the, the broad, uh, the broad uh, idea. And I think this is uh, uh, consilient with a, a rather uh, tolerant uh, uh, version of empiricism. Okay, so, Nominological formulas, they describe sets of possible relations between
categorical properties. Now you have uh, uh, the perfect gas law, okay, PV is equal to KT. The electrostatic force uh, is equal to uh, proportional to uh, two charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. You have sec Newton's second law. You have the Euler-Lagrange equations. We'll I'll come back to these things later on. And field equations. These are the dynamical equations. Uh, dynamical equations. Uh, they are, they are uh, usually partial derivative equations or di differential equations. Um, so a scientific law states that a certain class of things always satisfy some specific relation between their properties in normal circumstances. Uh, okay, can delimit the, the, the realm uh, of those circumstances sometimes in a rather a precise way, like small velocities for and a small action, a big action, and uh, small gravitational fields for the for the laws of classical mechanics and things like that. But so far, scientific laws have been characterized in the context of a scientific theory, again, like propositions, but these are contingently true propositions. When the, you have better reasons, uh, or with better reason to believe that they are true. Perhaps they are false, but you have better reasons to believe that they are true. So at this stage, scientific laws have been characterized extensionally. There is no necessity. There is no necessity. That's what the humans, uh, the, 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 the disciples of David Hume said. That's what laws are. They describe regularities and no necessity. They are contingently true at this stage. All right. Of course, uh, I will try to defend some kind of necessity for uh, uh, laws of nature. OK. Adult. Then, the truth of propositions can be uh, uh, about categorical facts, and in facts described by categorical properties, can be asserted by observation, like the, 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 the proposition, proposition this rose is red. There's no rose here, unfortunately, I forgot to take one with me. Uh, this particular body has a gravitational mass, okay? And uh, uh, those are all categorical properties. So, no, here there is an important point. The property of having a gravitational mass, that is the categorical property of having a gravitational mass, is distinct from the property, the property of having the power, that is the possibility to attract other massive bodies. All right? Okay. Um, yeah. Is it okay to interrupt, or do you prefer not? Sure, you know, if it's not too long, uh, it doesn't yeah, require no, a too long reply. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, well, it might be a very simple reply. Uh, this time I was a bit... So you talk, like you, you associate categori categoricity uh, with observation. Yes. Um, that can be observed, that's a dispositional term, right? Um, it's, it's, it has the power to lead to certain observation. Uh, yes. Right? So So... Unless there is another characterization that has nothing to do with observation, I don't see how this is not also a uh, dispositional property. Okay, okay, okay. We are, I've thought about that, of course. Uh, I think that in this case, you, 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 see, things that have been observed, you know, for the for the uh, uh, epistemological scientific realism, it's not enough that property be observable in whatever sense of uh, modality. Uh, could be a, a, a innocent uh, sense of uh, observability, uh, 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 an, empiric an empirical sense of observability. Simply that you know, when it has been observed, huh, then it is that that's the, the least we can ask. You know, if it has been observed, then it's possible to observe it. That that's it. I mean, that without entering in the uh, uh, notion of. Uh, of uh, 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 modality, but then, then uh, later on, since I want to ground uh, uh, possibility uh, on on powers, right, not the other way around, huh? then uh, the observability and like other modalities will be grounded uh, on uh, on powers, right? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So powers are more fundamental. Uh, so the, these are different, different, uh, different uh, 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 properties. Okay. And now what are uh, powers? Now that's of course a very difficult uh, uh, issue, <laughs> as, you, well, as you know. I am sympathetic here with uh, what uh, Barbara Vetter defends in her book, Potential Potentiality, published in 2015. Uh, she considers that uh, powers are primitive properties, right? They are not analyzed in terms of the biconditional analysis, you know, of, of properties by means of uh, counterfactual conditionals. I'm not going to get into this this, uh, this business since I simply take powers to be uh, primitive properties. I, I do believe that it's possible to defend that uh, powers are strongly connected, they are not observable, but that, uh, so they are metaphysical in the sense, they are not, they are not, but they are strongly connected with some basic experiences and then I believe that it is possible to make a good case in favor of the existence uh, of those powers without being too far away from an empiricist uh, uh, philosophy but I'm not going to discuss that uh, here uh, uh, either. I believe that therefore in the reality uh, of some powers for example uh, no in general a particular particular that instantiates a power P as the real possibility, the actual possibility, okay? the real possibility of manifesting M, namely a process, uh, a sequence of properties successively instantiated, or the persistence in a state that is the instantiation of stable properties that remain constant uh, uh, in time. And powers are identified by their manifestations. That's what Barbara Vetter says. Huh? That, that's what identify, identifies a power. So a power is not identified by a pair of uh, uh, manifestation and triggering circumstances, uh, uh, ceteris paribus circumstances, etc. So what a power is, is something that is uh, characterized by a manifestation. For example, uh, the, the, the power of a gas uh, at equilibrium, uh, well, it's to stay uh, in this <coughs> in the state which, satisfy the, which satisfies the nomological formula PV is equal to KT. Manifestation, of course, is not a very good word because uh, a manifestation can occur without you being or anybody to be able to observe it. But uh, uh, so the powers can be uh, manifested uh, without, our, 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 um, without us to be able to observe them. But of course, uh, for have good reasons to believe in the existence of a power, it must have been sometime manifested. So for the rest of powers, powers are intrinsic, unanalysable and irreducible properties. They are, that is, they are not uh, reduced to categorical, categorical properties. In particular, they cannot be reduced to uh, uh, biconditionals in the uh, 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 conditional analysis in terms of counterfactuals. Now, I'm. <clears throat> this is what you find in in in, uh, in uh, Vetter's book. For example, uh, an entity like an electron or whatever, has a charge E. And here there is a, a, a model operator, this uh, an, um, upside down uh, delta. Is it upside down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for all R and R or Q, Q is charge, the object X is at distance R from a charge Q. Then uh, X exerts a force F which is proportional to 
to charge E to charge Q from which it's distanced, it's, it's, it's a wave, it's at a distance R and uh, uh, divided by the uh, square of the distance be between them. So, of course you want, when you speak uh, of those, uh, this is a law, right? This is a law because you, you identify an object which has a charge and uh, you say that uh, when it is in the presence of another charge, Q, then there will be a force between them present and the force has the, uh, the a value which satisfies the numerological formula um, of Coulomb, Coulomb's law, uh, in this case in electrostatics. Okay? And you want you want to identify laws, that is the ontological problem of identification. Laws have, it, you know, it's difficult for the empiricists and humans to identify laws and to uh, distinguish them from fortuitous uh, regularities. Uh, you know that problem, and you know that uh, uh, David Lewis, <coughs> There are many objections to that uh, way of proceedings. I'm not saying that uh, the ones who defend in philosophy some necessity of laws of nature are immune from difficulties, of course, but uh, uh, I am trying at least to defend a, uh, a modal uh, 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 property uh, of, uh, of laws, uh, a kind of necessity. Of course, uh, uh, you don't. You want to disc the necessity you are after, uh, the the delta. You want the, the necessity uh, you are after to be distinct from the logical necessity, like you no know, true in all possible logically possible worlds. Uh. So you want something which is stronger than pure contingency of regularities according to the humans, and uh, but we you want to. Um, to be something, to have something uh, weaker, or at least conceptually distinct uh, from uh, logical, uh, logical necessity. So that's what, I, at least what I, I, I want. Also, I, uh, that's what I'm trying to defend. Uh, it's a notion of natural necessity, natural necessity, which is not a metaphysical necessity in the sense of people like Bird, Alexander Bird, who, of course, they have a conceptual distinction between uh, logical truth and uh, nomological truth, for example, but they believe that the, the laws of nature are true in all possible worlds. They call this metaphysical necessity. Uh, the terminology is not uh, stable. Vetter, for example, speaks of the necessity of laws as metaphysical necessity, but what she means is natural necessity. I think it's something weaker than the metaphysical uh, necessity, necessity that is truth in all possible worlds. So we want a necessity, uh, uh, that's the framework, but we want a necessity which is at least strong enough to ground the necessity of the following counterfactual. So, again, uh, possibility and necessity are not analyzed uh, in terms of counterfactuals, but uh, we want, you know, powers no? uh, to be strong enough to be uh, able to ground the necessity of comfort, con counterfactual like the one that is, you see on the slide. If x were at a distance r from q, then it would x with charge e. And if x were at a distance r from q, then it would exert a force f, which is equal to uh, eq divided by, a by r squared. And if in some possible world, I don't believe in the existence of possible worlds, but uh, it's a way of speaking, yeah? it's a semantic uh, uh, notion of possible worlds. You could imagine, could imagine, uh, it's possible to imagine, of course, 
that uh, there is there could be another power instantiated by the charge E, namely that uh, uh, the uh, force would not be uh, equal to the formula of Coulomb's law, but it would have a, a r to the third power instead of r squared. But that would be another power. That would be another power. So, what is the necessity? What, is, what consists the necessity of laws? So, as we saw, nomological formulas, but also their solutions, describe the possible manifestations in particulars endowed with some power. So, such manifestations are merely possible. So, uh, powers that are identified by nomological formulas and solutions also. Of course, you know, if PV is equal to KT, it's always a solution you know, that describes a manifestation. Now, if you have uh, 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 your, the Euler-Lagrange equations, then uh, it's not really a manifestation. The solutions might be manifestations, but the, the, uh, the, the, or the field equations, they don't immediately, so to speak, identify a, a manifestation. So, the power bearer, you know, the, the, the particular which, or sets of particular, the set of particulars, the system, which instantiates uh, the specific uh, power will necessarily instantiate also a specific manifestation described by nomological formulas or solutions given initial or, or boundary conditions. Now, in most laws, and that's of course an important point, is that the, um, the initial and boundary conditions there are, which are in some literature are considered to be triggering circumstances, right? And put, uh, for example, you have a, a, a body with an initial velocity, or initial position, uh, and initial velocity, and then um, you, feed, you feed the laws of motion with those initial conditions, and then in normal circumstances, uh, uh, the uh, uh, manifestation is described by a nomological formula, which is the solution of, for example, Newton uh, second second law. All right, mm. but that's the the important point is that the triggering circumstances are included uh, in the uh, um, nomological formulas in the sense that they correspond to specific values that the determinable quantities take determinate values. All right. Okay, that's that's a that's a crucial uh, crucial point, because it, of course that doesn't apply to mundane to mundane uh, uh, disposition dispositions uh, like uh, like uh, fragility and uh, uh, and things like that. But uh, um, unless it is translated into uh, specific uh, laws of uh, physics and, uh, and chemistry and things like that, but. Uh, um, uh, at least uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, 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 scientific disciplines in which you have uh, uh, laws, mathematical laws, then very often, almost always, I think that uh, the uh, uh, we'll be happy if you can come up with a with a, with a counterexample, you know, because uh, this is something I've been thinking uh, more these these last few weeks. Uh, the triggering circumstances again are included in the in the nomological formulas in the sense that specific values of some parameters or quantities uh, determine, you know, what you know the the, the the particular which instantiates to these initial conditions or boundary conditions uh, uh, will do. Now there is the notion that is introduced by um, by by. Uh, uh, by Vetter, which is the notion of maximal or quasi-maximal power, and it is true that many uh, scientific laws uh, correspond to maximal or quasi-maximal powers. <coughs> these powers that cannot fail to be manifested, again, in normal circumstances, okay, in the environment in which the laws have been previously uh, verified. And she says, quote, 
a disposition is possessed to the maximal degree by an object, or I say particular, but thing, entity, whatever, just in case the object can do nothing other than manifest it. That is, just in case it has no potentiality, I'm not making distinction between potentiality and power here, you know, I don't think it's necessary to interpret those distinctions for my purpose. Uh, just in case the object has no potentiality not to manifest it. Necessity is the dual of possibility. It is necessary that P, just in case it is not possible that dot P, a maximal potentiality of 2F, if, uh, uh, applies if it is to be analogous, no, a maximal potentiality of 2F, if it is to be analogous to a necessity, should be equivalent to the lack of potentiality not to F. And she calls that this conception the necessity conception. Okay? So that's, that's how she gets, she gets uh, 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 necessity from, from possibility and the notion of maximal potentiality. All right? Uh, I know this is controversial, but you know, I can leave that for the discussion. So, of course, such necessity is conditional. It depends on the contingent instantiation of a power. Okay? For example, you take an object X, like taking back the, taking again the example uh, uh, of the electric charge, well, it might be the case that an object does not instantiate uh, an electric charge, it's neutral, doesn't have a charge, of course, then it doesn't instantiate the power. Okay? Um, so, there can be worlds, there can be worlds, possible worlds, in which there is no charge. So let's suppose, no, 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 no entity uh, instantiates a charge. So in those possible worlds, the law, uh, uh, Coulomb's law, doesn't apply, okay? or it is perhaps vacuously true, we can discuss on that, but uh, so the, 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 the law is not true in a strong sense in all possible worlds. It's only true in the worlds in which it is, the charge is instantiated. So the necessity is, is conditional, it's conditional upon the contingent fact of the instantiation of charge by some particulars, all right? It's also contingent upon the uh, uh, um, realization of the normal circumstances, all right? Okay, so it's not, it's a weak necessity. Yeah? It's a, yeah. uh, Michel? Yes. One small question for clarification. So do you mean that the necessity itself is conditional, so that you would have something like a therefore box B, or it is uh, a, a conditional statement that is necessary. Yes, this would be the more natural way of reading it. Yes, yes. The difference, whereas the scope yes, of yes. If if there is a charge, if the charge, uh, then necessarily uh, the uh, no 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 the, the 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 sorry so the the the. The, 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 the model operator would be in front of the yeah, whole proposition. Yes, 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 yes. But then it's not a weak kind of necessity, that's full necessity for a conditional statement. Because it would still be true even if the condition is not. Uh, yeah, okay. Could you just, sorry, could you just re explain this relative notion? Okay, <laughs> because I missed this one too. This relative notion of necessity. The last thing you just yes, yeah, that I will take you. That's something that I'm not quite clear about. So perhaps we uh, <laughs> can. you know uh, uh, you're right uh, uh, um, and then then it would it's uh, uh, the the, the, well, the again the instantiation of a charge is contingent 
and then if the charge is initiated, then necessarily the Gulo law will apply. And so the model operator would be after. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Is that? Is that uh, that's Twitter. Yeah. That's Twitter. That's weird. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. That's what. Uh, yes, yes. But that's weird. It's, I feel like it would have some weird consequences, but. Okay, we I should say you are, you are the logician. Not the way you, you are the logician. All statements. Yeah, yeah. But isn't that what Vetter says? What do you think? It's a long time ago that I read the book. Yeah, pardon me? It's a very long time ago that I read the book, so I don't know. Ah, uh, okay. Right. But you know, of course, I, I have to be more careful. I take your point. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, you want a weaker notion. So yes, yes, yes. I want, I, I want a, a weaker notion. I, uh, 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 I am not a specialist on the logic, so I uh, just try to. I don't try to get into that because I'm not. <laughs> no, it's not about no, uh, not the really logic. But just like but uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Of course, you know. I, uh, what I say, the words must be consistent. I mean, it must be plausible, you know, from, from the point of view of, of the use of modal operators. So the necessity, uh, the necessary truth uh, of of laws is relative to some worlds. So natural necessity is distinct from logical necessity. So let me quote Mumford, which is a view that uh, I am sympathetic with. The metaphysically possible worlds are, uh, well, here, I would call it natural uh, possibility here. The, the, the naturally possible world, worlds would be worlds here. <laughs> worlds are a subset of the logically possible world. <coughs> It is wholly plausible, therefore, to speak of something being metaphysically necessary but logically contingent. We cannot deny that there are different modes of necessity. A notion of contingent necessitation is not so hopeless as long as we are not saying that something can be contingent and necessary in respect to the same mode of necessity. There was no reason to think that Armstrong and other contingency, theor contingency theorists <coughs> were ever claiming something quite so contradictory. You remember the ADT view, uh, uh, the Armstrong transcriptive view of, of laws. All right. So, if laws of nature are identified as necessary propositions, this provides a uh, an ontological pro a solution to the a solution to the ontological problem of identification, and then powers do fulfill a governing roles. They govern the behavior of the entities in which they are instantiated. Okay, if a power is instantiated in some entity, then this entity will necessarily behave, behave in a certain way, and. It, the governing rule is not uh, achieved by laws. Propositions don't are unable to ru to run or to govern the course of phenomena, as some uh, ontological views of laws uh, uh, defend. In some worlds, our gases may not exist, but there could be particulars with the observable categorical properties of our gases and another power with other manifestations like PV square is equal to KT at the same point that I made before with another uh, formulation of the electrostatic law. But these would not be gases, they would be other particulars because they have other properties, they, other, they have other dispositional properties, they have other powers. But their manifestation with the same categorical properties um, would be satisfied by the, the formula with V squared. So the categorical properties P, V and T would be linked in a different way. Um, I tend to defend the view, but again, this is a very controversial view. 
you know that categorical properties usually they are considered to be um, quiddities eh? that is not uh, that they, they would be different or they could be different in other possible words I then if I tend to the, to believe that well to defend the view but again uh, this is an argumentation that I cannot uh, uh, <coughs> put forward here that categorical properties could be identified across possible worlds and uh, that uh, the, the if wait it's not nominalistic you know if pressure is uh, is uh, is uh, if pressure is different is in another in another possible world it would be in another another categorical property but not uh, uh, the, the, the 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 property uh, it would not be equity now let's look at the two objections that's what I, I want to discuss in more detail now first of all uh, the problem with conservation laws and I will now discuss a paper by Psilos, Ioannidis and Livanios who try to defend what they call a dualist view according to which to ground laws of nature, some kind of necessity of laws of nature then you need, you need uh, um, real laws you know, laws in an ontological sense and powers, but powers in a thin sense. And that's that's the, the, the broad idea. Uh, I'm not going to, going to go into the details of this, but they object to a monistic view, uh, which is the view I defend, like Mumford, uh, that these powers are sufficient to ground the necessity of to ground the necessity of uh, 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 of of laws of nature, and we do not need a ontological conception of laws. Powers are enough. Okay, that's the monistic view in the context of this of this discussion. And sea uh, laws, etc. They say that. Uh, there is a problem with conservation laws and uh, they base their objection on Noether's first theorem and of course it's difficult to deny that conservation laws are laws of nature all right now let's I'm not going to go into the details of Noether's theorem which is would be challenging <laughs> But what, that's what they claim in their paper, a famous theorem by Amy Noether, the first theorem, huh? says there are two theorems, says that for each continuous symmetry of the Lagrangian function, Lagrangian function is a way of formulating the global energy of the system. Of a physical system, there is a quantity which is conserved by its dynamics. Well, the symmetry that is a variational symmetry. In fact, they should speak of the action here. Should speak of the action. It's a, that is the the uh, would be for every variational symmetry of the action for a physical system. There is a quantity which is conserved by its dynamics. In other words, there is a conservation law. All right. So the application of that is first theorem in the case of various continuous symmetries for discrete symmetries doesn't work provides as they say a unified and non ad hoc explanation of the existence of conservation laws and conserved quantities in the whole world briefly the theorem according to studies psilos and etc interpretation according to it, it's that a variational symmetry of the action implies a conservation law all right that's what the, that's how they interpret the, uh, the, the in fact in, in fact no doubt prove it in both sense 
In fact, yet, uh, wait, that's the first, but I'm not going, that's a good in, in, in physics manual, it's usually that sense of Yeah, yeah well, I, but the generalized <laughs> theorem has been proved by, by Alonso or I mean, the, recently uh, in the, <clears throat> but there's a paper by Harvey Brown, you know, we, maybe you know that paper. Uh, it's a very, yeah. it's a very, I think it's an important paper, but it's a hard paper, you know, it's a rather uh, technical. But to simplify the variational symmetry of the action according to the interpretation by, by uh, uh, Psilos and company implies a, conversation, uh, a conservation law. In fact, that's not correct. Huh? That's not correct. The, uh, and that's what uh, uh, Harvey, Harvey's uh, paper shows is that the Noether's first theorem is not the source of conservation principle. It can be in some cases, but it's not general. As uh, he says, uh, Harvey says, conservation laws and dynamical symmetries, that is, symmetries of the laws of motion and symmetries of the field equations, are consequences of the equations of motion or field equations which may or may not have a Lagrangian formulation. So you can have uh, also uh, uh, conservation laws with for, for systems for which we don't, we don't have a Lagrangian. So, quote by Harvey, the real meat, um, the real meat in physics ultimately resides in the equations of motion or field equations, which can be uh, <coughs> Euler Lagrange equations in the case of Lagrangian systems, which are the source of both the dynamical symmetries and uh, conservation laws. All right? So it doesn't matter here whether uh, you know or not what uh, the Euler Lagrange equations, but the point is that the, sim the, the symmet uh, symmetry of the Euler Lagrange equations does not necessarily follow from the symmetries of the action. Uh, it's usually the case, but not always. There are counter examples as we will see. First of all, a variation of symmetry of the action does not always imply a conservation law. Example, the linearly damped oscillator has a Lagrangian, but and then there is well there is a Lagrangian, the action is time invariant, but there is no conservation of energy uh, in a linearly damped oscillator. Sorry, I'm, I thought I'm speaking only for Alexandre, you see, but uh, you know, I'm not going <laughs> but to. I, I just want to add that mm. it's not the fault of Nota, okay? because she put the, the condition of application of her theorem very precisely, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's because yeah. physicists, yeah. we just, yeah, <laughs> let's apply it to any cases. And this is a good. This is a good objection. Yes. But that. But that was not in the condition because if you don't have local conservation of energy, you're already out, outside the domain of application of Newton, yeah. according to Newton himself. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But you know, I'm criticizing uh, uh, Psilos. No, of course. Of course, of course, of course. I think it's wrong. It's wrong. Of course. So the, the premise of their objection is simply Absolutely. is simply wrong. So I'm just keeping this. Huh? Um, the the uh, uh, ILP that is Ioannidis, Lifanios, and Psilos, they say that conservation laws hold for closed systems. For example, they make um, a big fuss about conservation of charge in their uh, in their example, but. It's not clear that conservation of charge follows from a symmetry principle because in classical, uh, you can deduce the conservation of charge from Maxwell's equations, but it's not clear that there is a there is a Lagrangian for uh, for for Maxwell equations in the in the classical the classical the classical sense with the appropriate symmetries to get the conservation of charge. Okay, so that's what Harvey told me. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not a specialist. So, it is true, of course, that conservation laws hold for closed systems. But, um, and they say that, uh, they, they criticize BERT, 
in that respect, because according to Alexander Bird, dispositional essences, that is for him powers, are monadic properties. Monadic properties are of individual particulars, but for example, charged particles. And then their objection is, is the following. How can individual monadic powers ground the conservation for some property of a system? So that's their objection. Huh? The, 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 the neuter theorem, according to, to them, they're all to the deduction of conservation laws, according to them, all for um, the conservation laws hold for closed systems. And uh, uh, powers, according to Bird's version, the powers there are monadic properties of individual charges. So is it the case that a system of two charges, right, can have the power to attract each other uh, according to Coulomb's formula? That's the objection. All right. How can you get the uh, a power for a system, the power to have force for the Two, two charges attracting uh, themselves for for the whole system. How can you get that global power from the individual charges? That's the objection. All right. First of all, you have to get rid of the senses, and then if you get uh, the, the, the uh, senses that belong to uh, monadic uh, uh, entities, then you can attribute according to me, it seems to me, there is no problem to attribute properties to systems. Uh, systems are instantiated, instantiation of properties in a certain area, uh, not, not necessarily in uh, point live or localized, uh, localized uh, uh, entity. So a system of two charges has the power and uh, you, you could combine those powers according to the uh, which is uh, ruled by the formula to generate the static electric field that satisfies Coulomb's and also Maxwell's laws of electrostatics and electromagnetism. So I don't see that there is a problem to attribute properties to fields including uh, dispositional properties such as powers. Of course, you know you have to get rid of the senses, and you cannot uh, 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 consider that properties are instantiated in substances and things like that, which supposedly have the senses. The conservation of charge, as I said, is not a consequence of uh, uh, Newton's theorem. It's a consequence uh, of uh, uh, Maxwell's equations and not of uh, uh, symmetries, apparently. And manifestations in this case are described by the solutions of the equations of motion or field equations, nomological formulas, which describe, as we saw, sets of possibilities. So the objection uh, by Psilos and company is that the, the power account and the, mon the, monadic, the monistic view of laws, that is, which is based only on powers, is enabled to account for conservation laws because conservation laws apply to systems. Okay, I tried to reply to the objection, and they apply also to closed systems, strictly closed systems. And uh, um, which is which is true. So the but and the only strictly strictly closed system is the whole universe. So in order to reply to that objection, philosophers like Bigelow and Bird, they have resorted to the kind essence of our actual universe, and they claim that conservation laws flow, that's the word they use, from the kind essence of our actual universe. That is, you can deduce the conservation laws from our actual universe. And from, since our universe has an essence, and an essence implies a power, so there is a power in the set of power, set of powers in the in the, the universe 
that imply, which since the universe instantiates those powers, this implies that there are conservation laws guaranteed by those uh, powers which belong to the essence of the universe, which is, of course, the unique member of its kind. Okay, as we know. And this, of course, seems a bit ad hoc, you know, because they want to save their uh, monistic view of nature by positing the existence of a universe, which are a certain kind, and the appropriate essence and the appropriate source of powers to guarantee that you have the uh, uh, conservation laws that you observe uh, in our universe. But also, it's redundant because they um, bird and uh, bird and uh, uh, Bigelow uh, claim, like I do, that uh, uh, local um, conservation laws are accounted for by local powers, like you know Coulomb's law and that you have a system of two charges. This system instantiates a power, which is identified, and what was done, which is identified by uh, a, a power which is instantiated by this field, the field that is generated by the two charges, and uh, this power is identified by its manifestation, that is some solution uh, of the uh, uh, Coulomb's formula. Okay, now there is a, sub, a second objection that is leveled against the uh, monistic uh, metaphysics of powers, so no, no real laws. It's the problem of quantitative uh, laws. That is, nomological formulas, as I call them, they uh, use properties that are generic or determinable properties, like charge. So charge can take an infinity of specific values. Huh? Um, so these are generic or determinable properties, which can take determinate values. So they say, a case such as Coulomb's law then gives rise to the following questions. How does charge manage the information that is available to it? How does it use it to, so that Coulomb's law is satisfied? In other words, why does it follow from the fact that Coulomb's force is distance dependent, that it is inverse square of the distance dependent, and how does the concrete charge happen to be sensitive to the right kind of information available in the inventory of possible values in such a way that Coulomb's laws is satisfied? Okay, these, these look like very anthropomorphic questions, but that's the... It's not very Aristotelian, you know, it's, it's just... Uh, but, and how do they answer that question? They say, well, there must be there must be a law, an ontological law, a reality. There must be, there must be a, a combination, a real combination of properties in the world, I mean properties of charge, property of uh, 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 force, property of distance, that are linked in such a way by the uh, Coulomb's formula, that governs, you know, how charge must behave. That's close to the ADT view, right? That's the armstrong dredsky uh, Thule view of laws. Huh? Laws are real entities that tell the individual things in the world how to behave, huh? or to behave well, you know, that is according to the law. Okay? And that's what they claim the power monistic account is unable to do. The power of monistic account is uh, enabled to explain uh, uh, <coughs> uh, how the, the individual charge 
the individual powers of the charge combined in such a way that the Coulomb's formula is satisfied. All right? Um, now, as I said, there is, there is the, the, the monistic, uh, like the monist metaphysician, like Mumford and, and myself, they, they reply, where there are no essences, uh, there are only properties, those properties can be instantiated in, a, in some area, they can be instantiated, for example, in a field, in an electrostatic field, which is generated by the individual powers of the charges. Huh? These, these are, and these are uh, uh, not explained, but they are identified by, I'm wary about explanatory moves, and you know, uh, Alexander knows that. I'm, I don't think that uh, explanation is a, a, a inference to the best explanation is a good way to reach some truth. But that's, that's another issue. But uh, here in this context, uh, the matter is not uh, to be able to explain how charges combine to generate you know, the uh, field with uh, such and such properties. The issue is, do we have reasons to believe that there is a power which uh, 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 has this kind of uh, uh, identification, it identifi identifying procedure by means of the nomological formula? That's, that's the issue. It's not, uh, it's not how can we explain you know, all those uh, uh, individual powers combined. You know, the, 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 the manifestation tells you uh, uh, what the manifestation is and then tells you what the power uh, uh, are. Okay, now coming back to, uh, um, to Vetter here. She says, like, like most all fundamental laws of physics, Coulomb's law states not merely a relation between properties, but a very special kind of relation, namely a mathematical function between properties of a very special kind, namely quantities and indeterminable properties. So a generic complex multi-track power is more fundamental, according to her, and I agree with that, than the specific single track dispositions characterized in the following way on the slide, x has charge E, a specific charge E, then uh, it is necessary that if the charge is associated, right, x has a charge E, uh, that uh, for R, etc., etc., x to force is equal to. So the Coulomb law, uh, the Coulomb, well, the Coulomb formula has an infinite number of possible instantiations according to the infinite number of possible values uh, of the two charges uh, uh, involved and also the, infinite, the infinity of possible values of the distance between, between them. But the manifestation, the, 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 the law uh, uh, tells that the manifestation, the numerical formula tells that the manifestation is this uh, uh, generic formula. And the specific manifestations are instantiations, so to speak, of this uh, uh, general or complex uh, manifestation. I think in this case you have something analogous to what is the case in, uh, in, uh, uh, for general predicates, like, uh, and that's the example she takes, like red, you have red, general predicate red. About that, it can be instituted by scarlet, you know, amaranth, uh, uh, purple, uh, purple objects, and, and there is a, an infinity, potential infinity of hues, huh? hues that could uh, instantiate that, and that that provided, provided, and then I I agree with the principle of instantiation, and uh, uh, Armstrong's principle of instantiation, but it, if there is at least one instance huh, of of the law, that is, if there is a case in the world, then you, that, that makes a case in favor of the existence uh, of the relation that is uh, uh, codified by, uh, by uh, Coulomb's formula. So it's not that the Coulomb's formula exists in some kind of Platonician sky, right? But it is, is it, if it is instantiated in a particular case, then you can consider that this uh, 
uh, uh, formula is is real in a way as a general predicate is real uh, uh, if there are some instantiations and uh, of course this is very Aristotelian uh, it's very Aristotelian why not and uh, uh, this allows to uh, counter uh, it seems to me uh, 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 status psilos and company objection so briefly a conclusion so uh, there is a salute to Hume and the Neo-Humians because laws of nature are logically contingent, but they are metaphysically, in the natural sense, necessary. In contingency, there is a contingency of normal circumstances of some laws. Here we can make the distinction between iron versus organ laws and like Armstrong's. Uh, and the contingency uh, of uh, uh, the truth of counterfactuals given some normal circumstances. The triggering circumstances are included very often, perhaps always, in the values of the quantities in the nomological formulas. And this natural metaphysical necessity, because powers are metaphysical entities, they are not accessible to uh, perception, is grounded, grounded on the contingent instantiations of causal powers. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm sure there will be objections. So <laughs> let's take five and we'll come back for the questions in five minutes.
Okay, question, comments? Peter. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, so, I very about this last slide, uh, very small. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm confused how unions can accept this story, uh, like how this would be about the union or the neo unions. Uh, I mean, Okay, laws of nature are not logically contingent, uh, are logically contingent, but I think this is like almost in the definition of a law of nature that it would be logically contingent, otherwise it would be a logical law. Um, but if they're metaphysically necessary, then that that's almost like literally saying I'm not union. No? no, no I mean, the law of nature is not no, 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 it's a bow, it's a, 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 it's a polite, uh, polite, uh, <laughs> it's a polite way of saying that they're completely But I, I'm not, I'm definitely, I'm not human, I'm not, I'm not, no. but, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm uh, human in a very uh, small, uh, minimal sense, if you wish, huh? that it is, uh, that the, uh, the, 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 um, the necessity uh, of, a, of a law is contingent upon the instantiation uh, of a power in some particulars. Okay, and this doesn't happen in all possible worlds. Okay, that, that's the only thing. That's the only thing. But of course, I am very uh, anti-human uh, uh, in, in many in many respects. But, but what I'm not very clear is about the uh, correct use of, uh, uh, of modal operators and you know the, the notion of necessity. But you know it's a very tricky issue. It's, uh, it's very, it's very. Uh, uh, I'm just. Uh, since you begin about that, uh, since, since you mentioned it, uh, I, I was thinking just now about the scope of the the, the box operator, the necessary, necessary operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it cannot be that it's uh, mm -hmm. um, A, therefore, box B. Because that would be like, um, uh, so that would be a, a law saying that if I have a bad uh, viral disease, uh, it's nece I ne then I necessarily uh, get a fever. If you would formalize that as uh, if, um, I have a bad viral disease. Box then box. Uh, I have a fever. That would mean that suppose I get this very viral disease. It's necessary that I get a fever. I mean, in the sense of then it becomes true in all possible worlds that I have a fever. It stays a completely contingent property, right? Getting a fever. So we can not put the boxes in front of these properties. It's only the link between them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I got that. So, I mean, there was no confusion possible even. Mm. The, the, the box has to be outside of it. But then, I wonder how it's different from what, mm. how you would standardly formalize laws. They are also, I mean, the, the most simplistic form is box A then B. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I know, I know, I, I know that. I know that that's the problem, you know. And but, but how would you formalize the idea that it's contingency of the instantiation, and given the instantiation, uh, it is necessary that. Yeah. So. How do you formalize that? I mean. I'm not sure, and that's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I don't that, know. Help me really to understand what the specificity is of your proposal compared to. No, the proposal, I, I, it's uh, uh, basically I, I agree with Mumford, except that Mumford, he, uh, uh, there is a strange thing in, in the strange thing in Mumford's book uh, about essences, right? He uh, he gives uh, he gives uh, four arguments in favor of the existence of essences, right? And uh, he says that uh, uh, these uh, uh, arguments, these four arguments, are not very strong. But altogether, <laughs> it's, it's make, they make a good case in the favor of the existence of a senses. I mean, that's, I but, think, but, so I want to get rid of a senses, that's the that's main, main point. But basically, I'm very close to 
I, I buy the monistic uh, uh, okay. the metaphysics uh, of, uh, it, of, uh, yeah, of powers. But Michel, yeah. you would help us if you were answering, do you think there's worlds with different physical laws? That it makes sense to say there's a possible world with different physical yes, powers. Yes, with different powers, yes. With different powers, with the same properties, or the properties will be different because it's a different world with possible The properties, the, the, the dispositional properties would certainly be different. Yeah, but P, the categorical one, could they be, will it be the same pressure but different laws, different power? Yeah. I think that's possible in your yes. I I try to defend that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 not, that's that's not bird. That's no. not uh, no. Bigelow. That's uh, already we have a better idea of the scope of your yeah, necessity yeah, 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 operator. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are they are identified uh, the, these properties they are identified you know well, by by the observation the actual observation that's okay. what you know harness is for example okay. and then it fits. And this this must be the same in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in the world in which you have the same uh, the same uh, the same formula because but there could be of course different there could be a different pressure you know in the, the sense that uh, it's not that's a possibility of course but uh, I think that there, it's a possibility also to uh, let me formulate this. As clear as I can, yes, I know. Because uh, <laughs> you're making it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I understood. Okay. The, 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 press, the pressure, volume, and uh, what's the other? The temperature could be organized differently because there's no such thing as not a, a, a kind. So gas and somewhere else could be governed by another law. But it's still pressure, it's still volume, yeah. and it's still temperature. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was your intuition, yeah, your basic yeah, yeah, intuition. Yeah, but now you're right. saying, yeah, maybe it could be other pressure. No, no, no. There, there's something that okay. could be cold pressure. You okay, know. okay. But that's yeah, okay. But that's a nominalist, nominalist Yeah, but the, the pressure in the world where it's not PV, uh, and KT. Uh -huh. Is it still pressure? Yes. The same pressure? Yes. Okay. I don't think the identity of okay. a property depends okay. on the relation. No, no. Okay. No, so the properties, relation. categorical properties, their identity does not depend on which power they are. Mm. I think okay. that logically you can make a case that, you know, properties uh, keep uh, the identity respective to the links that they have okay. with other properties. Uh, Nomological link? Pardon me? <laughs> Each time, each time, I th I think I understand your position. You you had something and I'm confused. But uh, uh, I will stop. I will ask my no, question no, no, at the no, end no. if there's time. No, 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 no. I mean, I shouldn't say, of course, a logical link. Yes, yes. Okay. But a, a mathematical, well, maybe mathematical is still so too strong. No, the idea is that uh, the identity of P and V and T mm -hmm. could be fixed independently of the formula uh, in which they occur. Okay. So you, you have PV is equal to KT, right? Or PV is equal to K, uh, PV square is equal to KT. It's, those are different formulas, but the properties are the same. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I don't know if this, this but, uh, makes, uh, makes okay. sense. But first before Daniele. Actually, no, Daniel, you go first. No, I'm waiting I mean, to make sure the whole, it's a question online, I'm waiting to make sure the whole question is there. I was actually connecting to uh, Alexander's question. Um, I mean, uh, but is it not the formula in our world, or in every other world, that defines what a uh, uh, physical property is? Yeah. For example, like uh, the thermodynamic properties, pressure, volume, and so on. So, I mean, if I don't have that formula, the, the idea of gas law, uh, I will have something different and not uh, uh, pressure or volume or uh, what else. No, no, uh, the, as I said, the uh, properties, categorical properties, they are not defined, that they are perceived. Uh, for example, how can I perceive, uh, in this sense, uh, a, a categorical property like mass if not observing 
the attraction between masses. I mean, I could imagine to be in an uh, um, Aristotelian perspective in which I simply say all uh, massive objects uh, fall uh, downwards, ignoring Newton's law. But at that point, uh, I will no longer have uh, the, uh, the power of attracting. So I can have one or the other. I mean, how can I perceive mass uh, without uh, calling uh, uh, the attraction? Yeah, you have the, you, you, the concept, the notion. The notion of mass is uh, 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 different from the... I'm talking about the categorical property of mass, right? Yes. Uh, uh, the, the notion of mass is, uh, is, is different. Uh, in uh, Aristotelian physics, and uh, uh, and uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Newtonian uh, uh, physics, but in that background, uh, in in both backgrounds, you have a notion of mass, and you can decide empirically that there is a categorical property uh, of mass categorical property of mass, that the categorical property of mass of this object is uh, bigger than the than the, this one. So independently, uh, you, you must have a notion. Huh? But I see that in both theoretical frameworks, in both theoretical frameworks, you can observe the property of mass. As, the, 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 as the same mass. As the same, as the same, as the same categorical property. the same properties. categorical property. But so of course you need of course a concept of, of a mass which is different in both theories. But what I'm saying is basically that uh, this concept of mass is not theory dependent. No. I mean no. in general as it's not theory dependent. The property is not theory dependent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Your intuition is exactly the same as Armstrong. Yes. Exactly. So, so Maybe Daniele is against Armstrong, but, <laughs> but Armstrong had the no, same intuition that you. These categorical properties could be governed by different laws, but they are the same categorical yeah. properties. So that's the intuition of Armstrong. Yeah, that's the basic that intuition of the uh, so Bakke, I think that he believes in equities, that they have a... Does he, does he think Armstrong believes uh, he, that? He believes that maybe in other world there's other laws, and maybe there's other properties, and that's in a very complicated world, a possible world, but the, the basic intuition you have that is that it makes sense to talk of mass independently of the law yeah. Yeah. is, is the, their basic intuition and it is exactly the reverse for Bird. Bird is saying exactly the reverse. It makes no sense to understand yeah. what is mass independently of what mass does. Yes, but, but doesn't Armstrong believe in liquidities? There is, a, the, 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 there is some kind of uh, uh, idiosyncrasy of property, of property uh, of, you know, let's say, mass uh, in our world. Of course, there is a property of mass uh, in another world, which, which is the same uh, as our property of mass. But, you know, it's, it, nevertheless, it is liquidity. Of course, you cannot capture liquidity in concept. There is, the notion of liquidity is a conceptual. I mean, the, but yeah. it is... Uh, it's unfortunate that if Julien is online, he is online. He has the question. He is the best to understand qualities mm -hmm. in, in Armstrong. So yeah. I, I would not like to say. To I, I don't understand what quality is, but, but but it's interesting mm -hmm. because your intuition is more with Dretzky and Armstrong than with uh, essentialist disposition. Is where there's no such thing as identity of properties independent of what they do, mm -hmm. of power. Yeah. But you want to distinguish yeah, yeah, yeah. categorical property from power, yeah. so yeah. that that's the same intuition as Armstrong. Yeah. No, I, I I think Armstrong is a fantastic philosopher. I mean, that's it's, it, there is no doubt about that. It's, uh, he wrote beautiful things. So I have a question online from Julien. Um, who actually? Oh wait, just just to add at the very end, says I was asking myself the same question on Armstrong and liquidities. I don't know the answer. Sorry. No. Uh, so, so if the specifics of Armstrong does not know, 
But his actual question was, uh, so he says, many thanks for, or uh, really sorry for not being there in person, and many thanks for your very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question on the conservation laws objection uh, against the, the metaphysics of powers. Um, your view, if I'm not mistaken, is that conservation laws are not meta laws, laws that apply to the laws, but are laws about a particular physical system, so the universe taken as a closed whole. But then, are they laws at all? If they mention one very specific individual, laws are supposed to not be allowed to index, to be indexed to, to specific individuals. So there's the first part of the question, and then how does that kind of a conservation law, as you see it, act, act on the local individual processes inside the system? How can the, how can the global constraint of, of von Frossen be enforced with that kind okay, of Okay, but I think law? if I understood correctly the question, these are objections to uh, Psyllos and Ivanios that you had in his view. These, these are objections to the view I, 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 uh, I disagree with because okay. I, I, uh, I, I disagree with this view that there is a universe of one of a kind which has an essence and then the <coughs> conservation laws flow from. I think that's a, it's an objection because then you, uh, that's interesting, you know, that uh, the uh, then the law would be true for one individual, that is the, the, the world. Of course, Bigelow and company, they don't want to say that. They say that the conservation law, of course, applies for the universe, but then it applies to systems, to some systems inside the universe. Uh, and, but uh, 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 I think that you know, the, the, the line of argumentation of the, uh, what's his name? Oh, Julian. Julian. It's near the line of argumentation is against the view defended by uh, by uh, uh, by Bigelow and uh, uh, Psyllos and company. D does that reply? Uh, yeah, maybe in that case, say a little bit more again about how you about your positive view of how the conservation laws work, because I think that's where there may have been a bit of misunderstanding. Conservation cons conservation laws are grounded on powers. Powers that are instantiated in entities, uh, uh, fields, particulars, uh, systems, and uh, they are because because the the manifestations the manifestations uh, of the of the of the powers they are described by by uh, dynamical laws. Uh, laws of motion, or field equations, or their solutions, and uh, not precisely their solutions, but these dynamical laws and, uh, uh, um, uh, and field equations that, might, that they may have symmetry uh, invariance. And that's where the, 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 the conservation of, uh, so the conservation law is part and parcel of the formulation of the, uh, the, 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 the dynamics, the, the dynamic equations. Okay. They, 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 flow to, to, they flow from the symmetries of the dynamics of the systems. Sure. Okay, that's the... So the power of first Yes, the, the yeah. conservation laws are not real laws. They are just the expression of the powers. That's right. They are, they are embedded, you know, in the in the inscriptions of the manifestations okay. of the powers. Does that make sense? But that's your position. Right? Yes, I mean, but you know, <laughs> I, we are in a seminar, you know, so I'm not. Julius is that Julius is that helps. That's clear. I'm not cool. so sure, you know, of all my clips, you know. <laughs> also, just as an aside, to come back to the previous point for a second, Julian also said. Uh, uh, Armstrong's combinatorial view of modalities may preclude quiddies, okay. but he's not sure. Okay. Not sure. It would be consistent, you know, certainly. Yeah. Questions, comments? Oh, cool. Thank you so much for the presentation. I just have curiosity, um, maybe you already answer your answer to it, but what do you mean with different physics? It's kind of, as you said... Uh, by, by the, I mean by laws of physics. No, by different physics. When you say that we, have, we can have different world, which we have different kind of physics, 
are you saying that we do have nonetheless the same categor cal um, categorical properties but in the formula they are arranged in different ways? This is for your different physics, but nonetheless we do have categorical properties in all the world. So yeah, all the same. Yes, yes, yes. Why? This is uh, just a philosophy. Why we, do, we can't say that? But this is from outside, I'm not in the field. Yeah, 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 okay. Why? Because we, but, but we can say that because we, the problem is how do we identify the properties? Okay? And uh, we identify the properties, the categorical properties by observation. Yeah. So that's why empiricists, they, they only believe in general that they are only categorical properties. They are categorialists. Uh, because uh, powers are not observable, are not immediately observable. Okay, and then uh, uh, um, if you if you only have categorical properties, or you are human, and then there is no necessity for laws, or what you do uh, is uh, uh, to have real laws, uh, which are relations between categorical properties that have strong threats to, right? If you you believe that laws are identified, uh, cannot be identified in purely extensional. Uh, that if you if you think that laws cannot uh, be uh, identified extensionally, extensionally, uh, then you have to resort to powers. Okay. Of course, you need to have some empirical reasons to believe in the existence of powers. But if you have powers, then you can make a case in favor of the grounding of laws having some kind of necessity. All right. So that's the um, from experience. In a broad sense, you can make a case in favor of the existence of categorical properties, which are immediately accessible, at least of them, empirically accessible, uh, and uh, indirectly, indirectly, but rather close to experience, by um, well, your experience of manipulations and things like that, uh, you can make a case in favor of the existence of, of powers, dispositional properties. Okay. Is it, did I reply to your yeah. question? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I have a question about maybe confusion about uh, your title of powers with the agents. I find I have two different way understanding. One is that power without essence it means just Alexander said categorical category properties and can be identified without laws, without powers. And the other way is to understand by the laws is concerns natural properties. Mm, some at least uh, not all law concerned about natural kind, rather the natural properties, because the, in this way the essence means kind of essence. So so I am confused by the two different way of understanding. No, uh, but if you want to call natural kinds uh, gases, for example, uh, that is particulars uh, which share a certain uh, certain properties regularly. So there is there are regular uh, associations of properties. All right? It's fine. And this is of course very uh, important in science because you can then formulate laws for categories of properties, classes or sets of properties. And this is a very useful for, for predictions. From uh, If you come across a gas, then you can, uh, you can say, well, you know, people <coughs> behave in such and such a way. So uh, it's uh, very useful to group uh, 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 entities uh, according to the properties they share or the, the, the regular association yeah, pro yeah. of properties. What I dispute uh, is that on top of, you, you explain, uh, some, because metaphysicians, they like to explain things in general. Uh, and that's like Brian Ellis, uh, that for example, he says that he says, Brian Ellis, he says, well, the fact that the electron has a, 
the electric charge of such and such value, a spin of such and such value, a mass of such and such value. You need a better explanation for that association of properties, simply that, well, that's just the case. Huh? It happens that it, they are together. So you postulate the essence uh, of an electron that implies necessarily that they have those three properties. I mean, to, to, well, that, this, that, that explanation at all. I mean, it's just repeating that you know they are together all the time. So in this sense, I'm very human. Yeah. Okay. Mm, well, I just <laughs> read uh, Alexander uh, one of Alexander paper Alexander Bird paper about he distinguished uh, natural property from natural kinds. He thinks not all property are kind property. Because um, just to say, it, he maybe view the mass. Who? who, who? Alexander Bird. I buried, buried, yes, yeah. okay. He maybe view uh, mass and electric char uh, charge. These are natural property, not kind, not, we cannot use it to uh, define natural kind. Yes, okay, uh, but then the, he says that uh, uh, those properties uh, are powers because he, he has yes. a, he, he doesn't believe in categorical properties, all properties are dispositional properties, according to Bird. And so mass has an essence, and the essence is uh, having the power to do that and that, yes. Uh, Thank you. Why doesn't he just say what mass is a power? But, you know, uh, I don't know. He has both, yeah, in his ontology, he has both. Uh, Julien just wanted to ask also a, a very classic, this is a classic objection, no originality intended here. Um, what about uh, for quantitative laws, what about possible but uninstantiated cases? So if there's a precise set of volume and pressure and temperature that's allowed by Boyle's law but never instantiated by any gas, there should still be a true counterfactual about it, um, which should be supported by the law. By the power, yeah. Yes, uh, because, because the, the power is, 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 uh, is uh, identified by the manifestation and the manifestation is a general formula is a, uh, with quantitative uh, uh, properties, quantitative properties, and then this this according to the realist view, uh, uh, the principle of instantiation. Even though there are uh, values that are never instantiated, of course, you know, that's a, that's a possibility. Nevertheless, the the general uh, the general uh, uh, formula is is real. And so that supports the truth. Uh, so the power is identified, and that supports the truth of the factory associated with factual. So that's the, 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 the way it seems to me that we can, uh, we can reply to that objection. Yes, I have a question about the, uh, again, about this idea that we, get, we are getting rid of essences but keeping properties and powers. So uh, I think you introduced this when you discussed uh, Categorical properties that you say that there are no essences, but there are real properties, for example, of a gas. But then, uh, when you discussed uh, a possible world where there is something like a gas, but it's actually not a gas, and why? Because its uh, behavior is described by a different equation. Why? And then you say that you are actually using the power to behave according to uh, boyle mariot law to a gas. Then why wouldn't we say that the essence of the gas is having the power to behave uh, with water? Because it's redundant. I mean, it's not necessary. But this is the wh why it's not necessary. If in the other possible worlds we use this as a criterion to say whether it's a gas or not. Yes, but you 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 only need properties to do that. You need you need the categorical properties, which, uh, as we uh, <coughs> said, there uh, there are trans world. I mean, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I have no objection to talk about the senses and natural kinds. Uh, it's, if it's useful, fine. Uh, referring to classes of things, I mean, the senses, the essences that are having such and such, such, such properties because it's easier, you know, it's shorter, it's uh, convenient, etc. 
what I dispute is to ontologize, yeah. to ontologizing a senses on top of properties. What is called in the literature a substantial view of a senses. I have a following question. It's still the same question. I'm still bothered by your, <laughs> your intuition. So imagine there's a world where the gravitation law is uh, R2, and there's another world where the gravitation law is R3. And these are mass, this is transworld, and this is distance. I don't know what your position about distance, but let's say. Uh, these are transworld. So, so these properties are the same, but different laws in different world. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what I'm, where I'm bothered is that, okay, I can buy that for quantitative law, quantitative law, these are different quantitative law, but basically they are qualitatively the same. It's the law is proportional to mass and it depends with a certain factor of the distance. Mm -hmm. And this qualitative aspect seems to me essential to keep the identity of the categorical properties. Because, I, I, okay, let's buy that, that, I reject that, yeah, let's buy that the behavior is not strictly the behavior to, to understand the, the properties. But if in this other world, it's something super bizarre, the gravitation law is, uh, is hard here, and maybe there's charge here, and you would, would it take the same mass? So it seems to me that you have to buy a minimum if you don't have a sense. If you don't have a sense, you have to buy at least that the categorical property are identified by qualitative relations, quali nomological qualitative relations. But of course, the quantitative laws can differ from world to world. Or, or, or it seems to me you have to buy that you, you cannot keep your intuition that these are the same. This is mass. Yeah. Okay. You, need, you need. I understand the, the because uh, because when you went, or you posit this is the same mass. That's it. But you seem to ground it in uh, some empirical stuff. Yeah. And the minimum when I compare mass is that there's something. You know, I don't need the R two, but I need something that that resists. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, some yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. Uh, attraction or some kind of uh, repulsion. And the attraction repulsion is captured by the qualitative relation between stuff. Yes, yes, but then if you don't have this, as you said, <laughs> this then that would, would be, uh, uh, well, yeah, it would be then another mass because the, 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 the way of uh, asserting the presence of a mass would be different. Yeah, it seems to me that you, Keep your intuition. There's different natural laws in the world, in possible natural laws, and uh, to keep the same property, you have to buy at the minimum something like the properties are related by qualitative relation that are stable through any world. Uh, yeah. In order to say that distance and mass, it's a certain procedure. Yeah, yeah. Blah blah blah. And this procedure, of course, does not depend on the detail or two or three. Then, okay, let's buy that. But at least it depends on something that the uh -huh. mass is related to distance in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, I see your point. You know, I don't have a, well, don't, don't erase that. Too oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, I think there is another problem here uh, because the uh, if if the if, it, if in this case if there is well it's the same thing with uh, with Coulomb's law. Uh, if there is a uh, r to the th to the third power, um, then uh, the s it seems to me that space would be different. Could be. Uh, then then space would be different in this kind of world. But the reason I imposed that is that uh, in the paper I wrote with uh, Paul Humphreys about changing laws, he says if we were in a world where suddenly this behavior transforms in this behavior, 
we would say the law change because we would still be able to say M is M and R is R because it's just a quantitative yeah, 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 difference. Yeah. But the qualitative uh, yeah, But but yeah. if you change the qualitative too, it's difficult to keep the identity yeah, yeah, yeah. of the categorical yeah. property. Did you discuss that in the paper? Uh, no, it, but it's in the paper because uh, in the section uh, changing laws uh, that I wrote with Paul, Paul tried to make sense of what, how a dispositionalist would argue that laws of nature can change, which is impossible according to Burke, because yeah, yeah, the yeah, physical yeah. laws are necessary, metaphysically necessary. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But he says, if if the 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 dispositionalist says, okay, my qualitative keep my identity of my properties, but maybe I can accept that the quantitative move. It's a very clever and tricky way that Paul managed to make sense of changing laws for this position is uh, essential is cross possible. Yeah, yeah, but I should have to really look at that paper. But this paper is about something else, so I'm not sure it's very useful, but just <laughs> how how you make sense yeah, yeah, of yeah. your intuition of categorical properties are stable, independent of the power. But you're an empiricist at the same time, so that, yeah. that's the main thing. Yeah, if you yeah, said, yeah, yeah. I don't care, they are, they're like Armstrong, Armstrong is saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you want to keep this okay. act, act, uh, empirical. Yeah, 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 empirical yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see, I see your point. Yeah, I see the, that's uh, what the uh, question is. Yeah. Daniele, last question. No, mine is just uh, a comment to Alexander's position, <laughs> actually. Because it seems to me that uh, in uh, this uh, uh, proposal, we get to another problem, to establish what uh, means to be qualitatively similar. Is this based, or does, or does it, uh, does this have to be based on an implicit assumption of essences? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. It's the relation, the systematic relation between the fact mass, when I put two masses, they, they attract. Could be different force, could be, but they have this general qualitative behavior. And it's how I, I do the, the thing you said, mm -hmm. the, the order relations. On the other hand, in another possible world, the, quantitative force would be completely different for the same mass. And it would be a different gravitational law with the same categorical properties. Or you, you, we say, like you said at the beginning, and this is exactly what Newton said, if it was different, different equation, it would not be the same properties. And this is al also the essentialists like Bird are saying. Yeah. If you have a different behavior, it cannot be the same yeah, property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that's really metaphysical, bizarre <laughs> intuitions. <laughs> Thank you again, Michel. Thank you.